all, we were talking about the vestibular labyrinth being involved in the cochlear knot. And this is what's been described at the moment as recurrent peripheral vestibulopathy. So, as if we don't, uh, so we basically, we, we don't have two conditions to differentiate between. We also have a third condition. We have Menier's disease, we have vestibular migraine on one end, and the third uh, uh, possibility, recurrent peripheral vestibulopathy, or if one can avoid using the word term in the lymphatic eye drops, at least the pathophysiologic involvement that may be similar to Menier's disease, but involving only the vestibular labyrinth. And with regards to my patients and who I see, I see many such cases of frequency tuning where the pure tone audiometry is normal. So this phenomenon, this, the presence of this condition, what we at the moment call recurrent peripheral vestibulopathy, may not be as rare as uh, previously considered and may be more frequent. And we may be seeing these patients already in our laboratory. Uh, so this is something that we need to keep in mind. And my argument here is that doing VEMPs, if you are able to do VEMPs, and I hope you will be able to do VEMPs if you are not doing them yet, helps you in determining if your patient has either vestibular migraine, many disease, or this third condition, which frequently shows a normal pure tone audiogram. I show a similar case, but this is again interesting as well. This was a 56-year-old female with probable Menier's disease, and she does have Menier's disease. The pure tone audiometry was uh, reported by the patient. I didn't have the pure tone audiogram with me, but she reported uh, that there was low frequency loss found with regards to the left ear. I did the, the CVM, expected to see the frequency tuning for the left ear on the same side as the pure tone audiometry. But to my surprise, I saw the fre this frequency tuning, um, not on the left, but on the right. So this is the left ear, and this is the right ear, one kilohertz and 500 hertz. And instead of seeing a larger amplitude on the left, where the pure tone audiogram was abnormal, I saw a frequency tuning on the right. Very interesting. So I haven't seen anything published uh, similar to this, and I hope to publish this case uh, soon. Uh, but it appears that we have a case of Menier's or Menier's-like condition, if you like, in this case. But the high drops, if we, uh, again, we believe that this is the cause of these conditions, is affecting the cochlea on the left, mm -hmm. but the sacule or the vestibular labyrinth on the right. Mm -hmm. So we have differential involvement of the two labyrinths, apparently, in this patient, or you can argue along this point, and you can give me your own interpretation, but why would this imp be important since we know that the patient has Menier's disease? Well, one that comes across my mind is that if you decide to do intratympanic steroid injection for these patients, in which ear will you do the uh, steroid injection? Will you do it in the left ear where the audiogram was abnormal, or would you do it in the right ear where the sebum was abnormal? An interesting question. I don't have an answer for you yet. Perhaps if the vertigo is the, the worst symptom for the patient, you may decide to do it on the left, on the right, but then you may argue, but you don't want the hearing to deteriorate on the left. Good arguments, uh, but this is something to consider. Um, and here I show a case of possible central cause of vestibular dysfunction, or this, this can produce good arguments as well. So the, I present here an 84-year-old lady with long-standing um, symptoms of vague dizziness, not described as vertigo per se, over many decades, and she has been helped all this time. Air calorics revealed diminished, this was uh, reported as being diminished bilaterally for both ears. The uh, referral letter from the referring physician um, asked me to rule out a bilateral vestibulopathy, although he told me that this was not compatible clinically. He did not believe the patient had a bilateral vestibulopathy, even though the air calorics were diminished bilaterally. And I went ahead and I did the CVEMPs um, in this patient and OVEMPs as well. So these are the CVEMPs for the left ear and the right ear. 
the OVAMPs as well, um, uh, uh, this is a 686 year old, um, even though you have some EMG in the background, like I said in the first lecture, you should do more than one trace. And as you can see here, you can see a reproducible response here, which represents the OVAMP, but probably better, better here than on the right, but you can see that they are in exactly the same place. So perhaps it's better here. So normal responses with regards to the CVAMP and the OVAMP. And what's in interesting here is that the CVAMP records from the inferior vestibular nerve, the OVAMP records from the superior vestibular nerve, but the air calorics rec records not, not only with regards to the lateral semicircular canal, but also the superior vestibular nerve. So why is there a differentiation with regards to superior vestibular testing, where one test is normal and the other test is abnormal? Well, with the, with, when you go into the literature, there is the, the known characteristic, the possibility that one needs to keep in mind of isolated horizontal canal involvement. That is possible to have isolated horizontal canal involvement in some of your patients, and this can describe the differentiation here and this differentiation here appeared because VEMPs were performed. So how, so what would cause, so again, this publication was uh, published by Chen Hen Hamaki uh, a few years ago, emphasizing the fact that you can have isolated horizontal semicircular canal involvement that looks like a bilateral vestibulopathy, especially when you see such findings on both sides and what can cause um, such a selective finding. Um, there are uh, reports in the literature and also by word of mouth that because of the complex nature of the, of the vestibular nuclear complex in the brainstem, certain lesions in the vestibular nuclear complex can affect the vestibular labyrinth selectively. Uh, but there is also the, the strong feeling, and this is also possibly this is also uh, may, may, will be true in some cases where a va vascular involvement can also lead to such um, selective involvement of the vestibular labyrinth as well. So um, the bottom line with regards to this case is that yes, you can dif have differentiation between paramedical examinations, not because of poor technique, uh, but because of um, either selective involvement of specific parts of the vestibular labyrinth. Hence, the beauty of using all these examinations, uh, of course, based on your differential diagnosis, to, to, to use in your patients a full battery that will, com that will uh, completely cover all your structures in your inner ear, your pure tonal audiometry, uh, caloric responses, vamps with regards to the otolith and the utricle, caloric responses, for the horizontal canal, we have the pure tonal geometry for the cochlea, and also we have at our disposal now the possibility of doing video uh, head impulse tests that can look at other uh, semicircular canals, not only the horizontal semicircular canal, but the, uh, the vertical, the horizontal, and the uh, posterior semicircular canals as well. So yes, depending on your differential diagnosis, but uh, the beauty of you combining all this together is that you can home in on where the lesion is with regards to the inner ear. And this is my final case, um, a young male with dizziness for four years. The, the symptoms were reported to have begun after diving. So of course, what comes to mind is perhaps a, 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 a development of superior semicircular canal deficits or a development of a third window. If you agree with me, uh, with regards to the high pressures involved with, with diving. The CT unfortunately was unavailable for review for me. As soon as the patient performed the CT, they went abroad. But after Professor Manoji's uh, uh lectures um, uh, yesterday, I was definitely in the mood and I did definitely did want to see that CT. And after his lectures, I would have liked to see those CT scans again. They were reported as normal, although, like I said, I did not see the CT uh, exams myself, but this patient had large CVAMP responses. I show here um, the CVAMP response on the left here. This, both of these responses are recorded from the right ear and the right stenocleidomastoid muscle. This is the CVAMP and this is the EMG. 
the CVAMP showed an amplitude of 90 microvolts, but the EMG was eight, giving a corrected amplitude close to 10 microvolts. The upper limit for our laboratory is 4.4 or, or maximum five. This, go, this patient went way above that. Um, so um, this is an example of a case where um, indeed, if a, a CT was reported as normal and you haven't seen it, and um, you, you get to see a C-vent response or an o -vent response that was larger than normal, you would want to see the CT scan yourself. And um, I hope to see it in the future, um, if I can follow up this patient at some point, which I will do, but I suspect that there is a third window syndrome, uh, syndrome going on, or perhaps uh, something similar, creating this large amplitude response, which would go with the, the, the fact that the history of diving and the symptoms appearing soon after diving. If you agree with me, but of course, this can be argued. Uh, so these are the cases I wanted to, to show you. Uh, again, this is my email here, but of course, there are other uh, applications of VAMPs that are reported in the literature, which I have also reported in the recent review I did with Dominic uh, Straumann, I believe last year or the year before it was published in Clinical Neurophysiology. I can send that to you as well. And also, if you have cases that um, you have in front of you and you, will, and, you would, and you wonder if a VAMP would be useful, or if you do do the VAMP in such cases and you wonder how the VAMPs can be interpreted based on the case that you have in front of you, that you, or you saw yesterday or the day before, you can send me an email with regards to those cases, and I can recommend how to perform the VAMPs in those cases, and what you expect the VAMPs to show um, if your differential diagnosis um, is, what, if your diagnosis is what you believe it would be. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, are you able to hear me? Yes. Perfect. I'll ask you the first question that comes from me personally. Do you have any restrictions or any contraindication for performing OVAMPs? I know CVAMPs, if I'm using AC, it would be a, a conductive hearing loss, but any visual or any uh, other restriction you will take or contraindication for OVAMPs? <laughs> that is a good question. Uh, well, the answer to the contraindications is no, if you know the contraindications beforehand. What I mean by that is that, okay, hyperacusis, I will go ahead and do it. And if the patient does not want me to, to, to perform the study because they find the examination is um, uncomfortable, then I will stop the study and not perform the study. But okay. even if a patient, uh, and I've had to, I have had one or two cases of hyperacusis being mentioned, but I went ahead and did the VAMPs and I got good VAMPs and the patient was okay. Um, now, the reason I laughed a little bit is because I had a case last month um, of a, a patient who came in, um, I did the CVAMPs, everything was okay. I, I started to do the OVAMPs, the, the mark was up on the wall behind her on the head, like I said, I routinely do the study with the patient lying down, so the patient has to look up while they're and she wasn't looking up. And I asked the patient, are, are you looking at the mark on the wall? And she said, yes, but I could see, but of course you have to look at the patient and it looked like the patient was looking directly above her. So I stopped the study because I wasn't getting an OVAMP response. And I sat the patient and I determined there after my attempt that the patient had up, um, up gaze of thalmoplegia, <laughs> which was not mentioned before in the history. And I actually sent this to, um, uh, to the referring uh, doctor. So a case of upgaze of thalmoplegia that prevented me from doing the OVAMP. But of course, this, this um, uh, was seen after. Now you may say, um, you may, it would have been easy for you to call this an unobtainable response and say, um, yes, the patient has bilateral utricular dysfunction or superior vestibular dysfunction or something happening in the upper part of the, the brainstem. Yes, indeed, but clearly there has to be a habit mm -hmm. of looking at your patient and not just at your recording monitor to make sure that they are cooperating with your study. You make sure even a, a patient says to you, yes, and they look like the sort of patient that will cooperate and they've been doing everything fine up to that point. 
With regards to these specific instructions, lifting the head up from the pillow, looking direct up as much as you can, they do need some encouragement to do it correctly. This is not their fault. This is a movement that we don't do on a daily basis. So they need to be um, specifically told how to do it patiently. You have to look at the patient. You have to see how they lift up the head up from the pillow, how they look, they clearly have to look up as much as they, as, as they can. You need to see the whites of the eye below the pupil and mm -hmm. to see the pupil go under the upper eyelid. And there you can be sure you will get a good response. Okay, next question is, cause of better response at uh, 1000 hertz versus 500 hertz, I think in the near cases. Um, what is uh, written in the literature um, is, uh, basically we're talking about physics mm -hmm. and we're talking about how um, waves of specific frequencies pass through a fluid field environment. And um, the literature agrees with this, although you won't find the literature having placed the recording needle in these sacks and, and saying, yes, the frequency was better because of the, the pressure being recorded by this needle within the, uh, the, the, the vestibular labyrinth, that somehow the increased pressure either changes the direction of, of movement of the sound waves within the endolymph and the high pressure is favored, favors a high frequency to move through the liquid, or the, the, high, the high pressure located in the vestibular labyrinth somehow changes the reaction of the hair cells to the sound waves. And therefore, perhaps with the high pressure, somehow they respond better to the higher frequency. Okay, next question. In, a, in your experience, does the CVAMP relate to staging in Meniere? Very interesting question. And you're maybe probably referring to a paper published three weeks ago, if I'm not correctly, about using VAMPs to alternatively stage Menier's disease mm -hmm. and not just use pure tone audiometry. I will, uh, share it, actually, I, will, I will share it on the group. I was hoping to do so soon. So I will share it for you. Yes, um, uh, I've, actually, I've actually got the paper myself and I'm, I'm actually in the middle, middle of reading it. Um, so it's interesting. I've actually reviewed this in uh, 2014 um, it is possible, yes. And in fact, um, if I remember correctly from the review that I did, you could actually have your stage one, two, three, and four. And I actually was able to conclude that using VAMP could actually split these stages into two. So you could actually get a 3A and a 3B, depending on the VAMP findings. Mm -hmm. So yes, if the question is, do you think it would be useful to use VAMPs um, to stage uh, menus disease, and I say, and I, my, my answer is 